أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم صلاة وسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيء ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيت طيبين الطاهرين سيما الحجة بقية الله العظم روحي وأرواحنا له فداء ولعن دائم على عدائهم إجمائين إلى قيام يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so one of our beloved teachers he's once said something beautiful and it's a good plan as well that we can go by when it comes to Laylatul Qadr. I remember he said that understand Laylatul Qadr as an opportunity that comes once in a lifetime because normally we have a tendency to think that Laylatul Qadr it happens every year, right? But he said no, you have, even though that they look similar and they look identical, you should understand that every Laylatul Qadr in itself is an opportunity that just comes once in a lifetime, not more than that. And this opportunity is an opportunity which is better than خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ Right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Holy Qur'an. So we need to benefit from this opportunity the best way that we can. So how can we do that? That's a question. First and foremost, it's important that we don't become like children that walks into a toy store and f every five seconds there's some sort of a toy that we want. No, we should be specific what we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. In other words, we should concentrate on certain things. Hence, he said that it's good, a good idea to have a plan for the three nights that we call Laylatul Qadr. Where the first night you focus on one thing, the second you focus on another thing, and the third night you focus on a third thing. But make sure to have a plan or a strategy. Imagine that you were told that the Imam of your time next week, he wants to have 30 minutes with you. He wants to sit down with you and talk to you for 30 minutes. Would you wait until you actually meet him? To think about questions you're going to ask him? Of course not. You will plan it. What are the most important questions I can ask the Imam of my time, right? The most important questions. What could I speak to my Imam about? You will think about it. You will have a plan before going. Especially if you know that, look, it's limited for 30 minutes. I'm only going to speak to him for 30 minutes. Laylatul Qadr, dear brothers and sisters, is no different. Why? Because it's not only the imam of your time, it's the creator of the imam of your time that you're speaking to. That's one thing. Second, it's limited to this night. Therefore, it's a golden opportunity that only comes once in a lifetime. So his plan or his strategy was that the first night you should focus on turning away from all the bad things in life. That should be the first night. Your main focus or the topic that you should discuss when you discuss the three nights, the first topic should be that you turn away from all the bad things, all the sins that we committed that limit ourselves. Allahumma aghfirli dhunub al-lati tahbi suddu'a. All the sins that imprison all our supplications, so they're not heard, or they're not granted, they're not accepted. So we actually, on the second night, can purify our hearts and let embrace all the virtues and make sure that we obtain the different virtues which is mentioned not only in the Quran but we also find it in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt And the third night, focus on a problem within your society or in your community. Something which is related to what we call social problems or social difficulties. Because you have to understand that the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes is conditioned to what you think or what you focus on. And we have that a lot in the narrations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see whether you actually understand what you're asking for or not. It's not enough or sufficient that you just ask for something, but you don't understand what you're asking for, what you're speaking about. Hence, once a person, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he asked him, what is it that you want? He said, I want you to make a dua, or I have a dua, I want you to make sure that it's accepted from Allah. This person, he said, okay, or the Prophet he replied, he said, okay, no problem. Tell me what you want, and I'll make sure that it's going to be accepted. This person, he looked at the Prophet, and he thought to himself, let me ask him something, which will be the only thing that you could ask for, like the best thing that you can ask for, the most superior desire that a person could have, or a human being could have. 
So he told the Prophet that I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me whatever he gave you. That's it. The Prophet, he said, no, 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 that's not enough. Explain exactly what you mean. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see whether you actually understand what you are asking for or not. The person says, I thought to myself, whatever blessing that God he could give to a servant, he would give it to his most beloved servant and that would be you. He said, okay, fine, accept it. He said, I want to be your neighbor in paradise. He said, you want to be my neighbor in paradise. That's simple. This simple. But understand what you are talking about first and foremost. Listen to this narration and then you understand why it's so important to, to understand what we are speaking. When we're speaking or asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, that we know what we are talking about. The Imam, he says, وَمَا أُوْتِيَ مُؤْمِنٌ قَدْتٌ خَيْرُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَ إِلَّا بِحُسْنِ ذَنِّهِ بِاللَّهِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives something good for mu'min, for a believer, in this world or the hereafter, it's only because of his good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about what's going on here. Do you understand what you are asking for or not? And the opposite. لا يعذب الله مؤمنا بعد توبة والاستغفار إلا بسوء ذنه بالله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish a believer بعد توبة after repentance and after he was forgiven إلا بسوء ذنه بالله Except if he has bad thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It goes back to what? What you think. Do you understand what you're asking for? Do you understand that? Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, it's important for us to focus on two or three bad habits or some sins that are specific in order to get rid of that. Not be like that kid that walks into a toy store and don't know what they're looking for. Every five seconds they're feeling they have a need for, for a certain toy and they forget about that toy 15 seconds later. Don't be like that. Understand what you are asking for. Then we understand that the thing that we should be asking for tonight is to make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He purify our hearts for all the pollution that our sins have caused. All the pollution that our souls have been polluted with because of the sins that we have committed. Hence one of the most recommendable actions that you can do tonight is what? Doing la'an of who? The person who killed? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allahumma la'an qatalata amir al-Mu'mineen. Why? Because Ibn Muljim embodied all the spiritual diseases in that society at that time. He was the representative of all the corruption that existed in that society. If we don't free ourselves from the bad things or the sins, dear brothers and sisters, we're going to be in shackles. In other words, it's not going to be possible for you to understand and f understand the pleasure and the deeper layer of, of goodness. And nobody should tell me that, oh, Sheikh, we should focus on sin. That means that it's going to be a pessimistic discussion or it's going to be a pe pessimistic topic and we're just going to sit here and cry. And be no, 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 no. Let's speak about the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to hear about the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he said it in Hadith Qudsi. That what? If there's no servants that commit sins in this world, I would create servants that commit sins so I can forgive them. He's not giving a green light so you can commit sins. But he loves when his servants, they repent. Why? Because he's compensating for all the bad things they've been doing, all the pollution. He will purify their, his hearts. And he loves his servants. Are you telling me this is a pessimistic dis discussion? In fact, this is the most optimistic aspect of Islam if you understand it in its right context. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, what is it that he says? Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahireen. He loves those who, do rep who repent. He loves the people that purifies themselves. It's not a pessimistic discussion. In fact, it's the most optimistic aspect of Islam. Then a person can be like, but Shaykh, if we have to speak about our problems and our issues, doesn't that give us a lack of self-esteem or low self-esteem and low confidence and so, because that's a discussion if you talk to a psychologist in this western world they will tell you don't think about your past don't be stuck in your past right Allah says that in the holy Quran as well that they don't do what in order for you not to despair over matters that pass you by we have that in the holy Quran but it's different when you're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not like speaking to a friend don't mistake these two things when you're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is able to compensate for your shortcomings. He is able to compensate for your mistakes. 
And contrary to, for example, if you bring out your mistakes and your flaws to your friend, for example, what can you do? Forgive you? You can't do nothing. All the sins you committed, you're going to see the negative consequences of it. Whether your friend likes it or not. Whether he's sad on your behalf or not. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's different. Yes, if you sit for yourself and with your own thoughts, that's an issue. That's an issue. You will become depressed, you will be this and that. But when you speak to Allah about your shortcomings and your mistakes, that's different. That's like a child that messed up their clothes. And they went to the mother. The more they apologize, the more comfort she gives the child. Why? Because she loves the, the child, right? She comforts the child. Because of what? She loves the child. The more remorse that child shows to his mother, the more she comforts it, says it's okay, don't worry, I'll compensate, I'll wash your clothes, don't be sad about it. In other words, you become a free thinker. You free yourselves from these thoughts. You don't become depressed or feel alone, like when you're speaking to other individuals or when you're sitting with yourself with your own shortcomings and with your own mistakes. Therefore, it's very important, dear brothers and sisters, that we understand that the first night is to purify ourselves, purify our souls and hearts. And we can only do that if we accept the sins that we are committed, acknowledge the sins that we committed. What kind of sins that we should seek repentance from? I'm going to mention that, inshallah, because that's an issue as well. That's a huge problem in our communities is that when we are seeking repentance, we don't know what we are talking about, like the kid in the toy store. We're just saying, Allahumma ghfirli dhunu. That's it. Well, what sin? Do you understand what you're talking about? On the day of judgment, you, when you're going to show up, he's going to ask you, tell me which sin that you were talking about. If you can't mention it, don't expect it to be forgiven. You need to know what you're speaking about. So that's the first thing. Second, one of the most recommended actions to perform on this holy night is that you, discuss, you seek knowledge or you do what is called tafakkur, contemplation. So I want to bring up a discussion here, and that's a discussion we've discussed a bit about in the Islamic Center as well, because it's important and it's related to our topic as well. So how do we define sins then? How do we define sins? Dear brothers and sisters, sins, you know what it means? Sin or committing a sin means basically that you hurt yourself. You hurt your physical body, you hurt your soul, and you polluted your heart. That's the definition of sins. But unfortunately, because we don't understand this principle, or we think that it's conditioned by your beliefs. If you're a Muslim, it's a sin. If you, are, if you aren't a Muslim, then it's not a sin. You can do it whatever you want. We don't think that there's an objective truth behind those actions, and therefore we don't consider sins to be hurtful. Why it's difficult for us to refrain and avoid sin sometimes, and seek repentance as well. Because when you look at an apple, if you look at an apple, the chemical structure of an apple which is stolen and which is not stolen, they're, diff they're not different. From a physical perspective, there's no difference between the two apples, right? Chemical structures, it's identical. But the reality is different. The reality is different. Don't limit yourself to the physical causes or material causes. We have another cause as well, which is the metaphysical causes. And they are part of this reality as well. And we should understand that. Hence, the Prophet ﷺ, when there were two of his companions that backbited another person, backbiting another person, he saw the reality and he, and he to, told them that I see traces of meat in your face. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he saw the reality of that sin. Yes, you might not understand how eating a haram apple, apple which is stolen, might affect you. You don't know. But it, it does affect you. And the people with hearts that have, they have cultivated their hearts to an extent where they understand the reality behind these actions, they see it. Hence, it was easy for Ahlul Bayt to stay away from sins because they saw the reality of sins. If I were to ask you, if you are thirsty, for example, and you see there's some water on the side of the street, for example, it just rained, would you drink that water even though you were thirsty? You would, of course not. Because you know how polluted that water is. The same applies to sins. We should change our perception when it comes to sins. If we don't change this perception, dear brothers and sisters, then unfortunately we can't avoid sins. It will be difficult for us to avoid sins and refrain from sins. So another question, why is it that we should apologize to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then if we're hurting ourselves? That doesn't make sense. If the doctor tells you to, to take a 
specific form of medicine, you don't go and apologize. If you get a ticket because you crossed red light, you don't apologize to the police officer. You, you pay the ticket and you move on with your life, right? So why is it that we should apologize to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us so much to an extent that He is willing to compensate and create a miracle and change this firm order that He created this universe with. With the condition that you are willing, you understand what you have done, and then afterwards you repent. You seek repentance. And this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm telling you, you can see it all over the Quran. Fir'aun, is he a bad person or not? Should we love Fir'aun? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it that he tell? He said, Musa, go to Fir'aun, he transgressed, he's an oppressor. But when you do that, speak gentle to Fir'aun. When you read this verse, you doubt, Allah, are you with Musa, are you with Fir'aun? Right? He said he, trans he hurt himself. I want Fir'aun to be guided as well, as much as I want Prophet Musa salam, to be guided. He didn't want guidance, that's his own fault. But we should understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants to compensate for the sins that we have committed. And sins basically, you know what it is, other than just hurting ourselves, it is to satisfy a need while you're sacrificing other deeper layers of your needs. In other words, you have many desires as a human being, you're an ocean of needs and desires. But you should prioritize, if you don't prioritize, you know what you do? In order to satisfy one superficial need, you sacrifice other deeper needs that you have and you don't satisfy them either. For example, in the holy month of Ramadan, we're supposed to fast, right? Question, eating and drinking, that's a need, right? It's essential if, in order to survive. But there's another need as well. That's the need for self-control, discipline and taqwa. There's a conflict here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, stay away from that food and that the water and all these things, don't drink anything for a couple of hours. Why? Because you're going to satisfy a need that are deeper than the need, the superficial need of eating and drinking for these couple of hours that you're fasting. Don't be like a person who tried to fix his eyebrow and he ended up poking his eye out. Yeah? And that's exactly what you do when you commit sins. Understand when you're satisfying a need through a sin, there's actually alternative ways to satisfy that need in a way where you're not sacrificing other desires and needs in life. And that's how we should perceive sins as well. Understand that sins are basically hurting ourselves. But unfortunately, we don't have this perception. So when we read the Quran, we think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He just wants to punish us if we do something that makes Him angry. Blessed are the people that read the Holy Quran and when they reach the verses of the hellfire, they understand the love and compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his servants. Because they see the verses of the hellfire as a threat not to hurt yourself. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much he loves me. He's threatening me so I don't hurt myself. Because he tells them maybe it's because of the respect of me or the, the fear for the hellfire that you're able to what? To refrain from sins or avoid sins. Blessed is the one who understands the Holy Quran like that. In a narration from Imam Baqir السلام, he states, مَا يَنْجُو مِنَ الدَّنْبِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَقَرَّ بِهِ Only a person who acknowledges his sins will be saved from those sins and the negative consequences of those sins. Then, you know what it means? The word, it means an action where there's some negative consequences after it. Basically, you're committing a sin and you're going to face those negative consequences. But you're going to be saved from that if you acknowledge it. And this is the night. Tonight is the night to do that. All the sins that hurt us, all the sins that prevents us from understanding the pleasure of seeking closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the blessing that lies within the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the things that prevent us from doing that. Once a person, he came to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Please recite the salawat. He came to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and he's told Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, I've committed this sin and I want you to perform the hudud. I want you to punish me. So this person committed a sin which basically leads to capital punishment. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he was, he was annoyed. He said, why are you coming to me and telling me about your sins? You should have repented in private. Don't go out in public and tell people about your sins. 
He said, okay, but now you come and you, you made it public that you committed this sin. You have to perform the hudud. Amir al-Mu'minin, he was listening to this person. He started to cry and he went to sujood. Not because he was afraid. Amir al-Mu'minin was listening to what he was saying. And this person kept telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look, I've come here to the most blessed individual, to the best of your servants, to be punished, just to purify my heart. So in the hereafter, I'm not going to be held accountable for this action that I did. And he kept telling himself this to an extent where he started crying and shedding tears. Amir al-Mu'mineen was just standing above him and he was listening to this person's words. While he was doing it, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he started to shed tears himself. This is the true meaning of repentance. That you acknowledge the sin, you understand what you're seeking repentance from. This person, he stood up, he said, I'm ready to be punished. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, stand up and go, just leave. He said, what is it? He said, all the malaika, they shed tears when you start to repent like that. Let alone Amir al-Mu'mineen, This is the true meaning of seeking repentance. That you understand what you're seeking repentance from. And you understand that you hurt yourself. You don't hurt other individuals. And that's easy to understand. Once there was a person who asked me, he said, Sheikhna, if it's possible for you to, if there was one thing that you will, you'll be able to say that it's not haram anymore, it wouldn't be considered haram anymore, what would it be? I told him, you can't, that, can't even, <laughs> that's a weird question. You know why? Because the definition of sins is that you hurt yourself. That's like asking me, Sheikh, if the 20 types of poison that you can drink from, which one would you drink from? None of them. <laughs> Why would I drink from a po- glass of poison? That's stupid, right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we hurt ourselves through these sins, there's a reality behind it. And we should believe that, we should understand that so we can acknowledge it and make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives us on this, in, on this holy night, dear brothers and sisters. Therefore, the one who is... Consider himself to be the biggest sinner tonight, dear brothers and sisters. He's the winner. The person who wins the competition of Laylatul Qadr is the one who considers himself to be the biggest sinner. Ahlul Bayt were infallible. But look at Dua Hab Abu Hamza Thumali. Are you telling me, bring one person that can write a Dua like Dua Abu Hamza Thumali? How much in depth he saw himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's how you win the competition. To recite those verses and rec- understand what you're seeking repentance from. This is the most beautiful part of Dua Abu Hamza Thumani. That it's an infallible person who's seeking repentance. Look how he's seeking repentance. We should take inspiration from that. To understand it. But understand that you hurt yourself. And trust me, our societies will understand. Before 15, 20 years ago, if you spoke about self-control and jihad on nafs in schools, they would laugh at you. It was an individual freedom, go for what you like, your own desires, this, that, right? They would laugh at you. Today, everybody is speaking about discipline. If you want to be famous, speak a bit about discipline on social media, everybody loves you. It will come to an extent where everybody understands when we are talking about sins, it basically means that it's something that hurts you. Once I was in a university, it was in Iran, and... I remember this person, it was about discussion about hijab, and I was sitting there, Mu'ammam. So this sister, she walks up to me, and she sits right next to me, and she takes off her scarf completely. She's like, I want to sit like that, so what? I was like, well, nothing, I'm not sensitive. I was born and raised in Denmark, I've seen worse than that. So she looked at me, she was like, so, <laughs> uh, so what's the issue of me being like that? I was like, no issue. I have a question. She was like, yeah, let me know. Do you, do you have a boyfriend or a husband? She said, yes, I do. So what? So nothing. I was just asking. Do you like your boyfriend or your husband to be committed to your relationship? She said, yeah, of course I do. So, okay. If, you're, if you are to choose between two types of women that your, your husband or your boyfriend could work with in a workplace, would it be a woman who observes modesty and wears proper hijab? Or would it be somebody who doesn't wear don't have any modesty who flirts with your husband or your boyfriend. She said, of course not. I would choose the one who's religious and has modest, observed modesty and so on and so forth. I was like, so you don't want to observe it yourself, but you want others to observe it? I told her, look, in a society where there's no modesty, men are not going to be committed. He's going to be, he has to be a, one amongst the awliya Allah to be committed to a relationship then. Do you like your boyfriend to be committed? 
observe modesty in a society. She understood it. And slowly she put up back the scarf again. That symbol, that symbol, hijab, hell is hotter, right? That's what they normally <laughs> tell people. Of course, if you have a superficial understanding like that and you can't explain why modesty is important in a society, of course they're gonna be like, this guy is just dogmatic. He's just talking about not making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry and we know that God, he's merciful, so he's gonna forgive us. They don't understand sins as being hurtful to themselves, to the society. They don't understand it like that. What kind of sins should we repent from? The first thing that we should seek repentance from, dear brothers and sisters, that's the positive view we have of sins, unfortunately. If there are certain types of sins, and sometimes, unfortunately, I see it, there's believers, when you speak to them, they'll be like, I wish this thing wasn't haram, right? He says he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there's certain things in life where he actually has a hidden desire for it. That's the first thing you should be seeking repentance from. Why? Because if you have a positive view of sins and that sin has turned into a habit, you can't change a bad habit if you don't consider it to be a bad habit. How are you going to change it then? That's like a person not understanding it's hurtful. That he's hurting himself. Why should that person change that habit then? That's the first thing we should seek repentance from. That's the first thing. Second, repent from all the sins that we committed because of peer pressure, because we were scared that what other, other people might say, and that happens a lot in the Western society and Western communities. I'm, I'm afraid of what my colleagues is go are going to say. I'm afraid what the people in my society or my community at the uni or whatever it might be might say about me. And sometimes I fall into certain types of sin and that you know what the dangerous part about that that the dangerous part about this is that if you accept peer pressure and you commit sins because of that that's a slippery slope it starts with few sins small sins and it just develops until you you see this person who entered university as a mu'min he comes out as a mulhid and we have examples of that as well he entered the university because of peer pressure, because of the people around him. He kept committing certain types of sins to an extent where he thought, you know what, forget about it. Who said God exists? <laughs> he wanted to solve the issue here. Instead of fixing his eyebrow, he poked his eye out, as we mentioned. So that, that is the two things that we should seek repentance from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, inshaAllah, to seek repentance and to purify our hearts on this holy night, inshaAllah ta'ala. In a narration about Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad <coughs> It is narrated that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in the month of Ramadan he used to eat iftar at his children's place like one day it was Imam al-Hassan one day it was Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam on the 19th of Ramadan tonight he was supposed to eat iftar at uh, say the Zainab, Lady Zainab Salamun in his place at her house. So he went there and they ate together. Lady Zainab, she noticed that Amir al Mu'mineen he's a bit worried. He kept looking up to the sky and Lady Zainab became worried herself. She said, What is it? What's wrong? She was so worried that she told Amir al Mu'mineen Please don't go to the masjid tonight. Just stay here tonight. I'll take care of you, just stay in the masjid, just stay in my house, my place tonight. Amir al-Mu'mineen he said, no, I have to go. I have an appointment. Amir al-Mu'mineen he went towards the masjid, he started his prayer. This mal'oon, he came and he struck the blessed head of Amir al-Mu'mineen He struck the blessed head of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but Amir al-Mu'mineen showed no remorse or no pain at all. Nothing. Until Hassan, Imam Hassan al mushtaba alayhi salam, he came and he saw that the blood was flowing down the face, the blessed face of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And his beard, there was blood in his beard as well. Imam al-Hassan, he helped Amir al-Mu'mineen to come home. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, he kept shedding tears, he kept crying, looking at Amir al-Mu'mineen's face. Every time he looked at his face, he stopped crying and shedding tears. Amir al turned around, he said, my son, Hassan, have patience. Be patient. Things happen. That's how it is. Imam al-Hussein, he heard what happened. 
He rushed to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and he saw Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam lying down. As Imam Hussain alayhi salam saw Amir al-Mu'mineen, he started shedding tears as well. Amir al-Mu'mineen told him the same thing. He said, Imam Hussain, be patient, have patience. This happens. But when it came to Lady Zainab he didn't tell her to have patience. As the daughters of Amir al-Mu'mineen they entered the house and they were sitting right next to Amir al-Mu'mineen. They started crying out loud. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he opened his eyes and he looked at Lady Zainab. He said, Ya Zainab. He didn't speak about patience. He just started crying out loud himself. Because Amir al-Mu'mineen he couldn't take that Lady Zainab was shedding tears. Ya Ali, but where were you in Karbala when Lady Zainab was shedding tears? But she was looking out in the desert and she saw her brother Hussein lying in the sand. And this mal'oon was sitting on his chest. Allah la'natullah ala qawmid dhahlimeen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tayyabina tahirin.